introduction. You'll notice at the end of the introduction, Prabhupada adds most of the verses of the Gita Mahatmya. So, here you can see the meaning. One may cleanse himself daily by taking bath and water, but if one takes a bath even once in the sacred Ganges water of Bhagavad Gita, for him the dirt of material life is altogether vanquished. Okay, so Ganga is here in Mayapur. It's not very clean just now. The rainy season, you get a lot of garbage coming up. Looks pretty dirty actually. But water of the Bhagavad Gita cleanses the dirt of material life altogether. So even more powerful than the Bhagavad Gita, than the Ganga water is the Bhagavad Gita. One need only attentively and regularly hear and read Bhagavad Gita. One need not read any other Vedic literature because it is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavad Gita, is essence of all Vedic literature. So the essence of the Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Gita Mahatmya is saying we don't need to read any other book. Well, certainly it's a good start. If you get through the Bhagavad Gita, Shank Shankaracharya also says, a little knowledge of Bhagavad Gita and a few drops of Ganga water, and you can get liberation from the material world. Okay, so this is one of the famous verses of Gita Mahatmya. This Gita Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, the essence of all the Upanishads is just like a cow. And Lord Krishna, who is famous as a cowherd boy, is milking this cow. Arjuna is just like a calf, and learned scholars and pure devotees are to drink the nectarian milk of Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita is Gita Upanishad, right? It's one of the. It's not one of the one hundred and eight Upanishads. So the Upanishads they are Shruti, but Bhagavad Gita is from Mahabharat, and Mahabharat is Smriti. And so some people don't accept Bhagavad Gita. But anyway, it's described here, it's the essence of the Upanishads, just like a cow. And Krishna is the cowherd boy, and Arjuna is like the calf. And the milk is the Bhagavad Gita. So we're supposed to drink the milk of Bhagavad Gita. So maybe you did this before. If you did it before, it won't take you very long to do it today, right? What aspects of Prabhupada's modern mission are revealed in the preface? Now some aspects will relate to the mood and some will relate to the mission. Would you like to take a few minutes to just recall, or do you have your notes with you from last week? Can anybody say just now, what was Prabhupada's yes, mood? Sir. Would you like to tell me Prabhupada's mood in, in, in uh, in the preface? Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji. Yes, Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, Maharaj Ji, uh, we uh, read and discussed that uh, Srila Prabhupada always uh, give the credit uh, to his spiritual master or we can say uh, he has given the gratitude uh, towards uh, his spiritual master. Apart from that, um, he, he wanted Bhagavad Gita to present as it is without any adulteration. So are you giving me mood or mission or both? Which one was, uh, which was it? Was it, were you telling me mood or mission? There's a difference. Uh, one mood and one mission. You gave me one mood and one mission, right? Tell me what was the mood? Right. Uh, the gratitude towards the spiritual master. Okay, and the mission? Uh, Bhagavad, present Bhagavad Gita as it is without adulteration. Okay, thank you. Right? So another mood was discussed is the compassion. Compassion was also discussed by us. Compassion. Can you give me the quote compassion. from the pre? Give me the quote from the preface. Um, 
right? We want to we wanted to know as revealed in the preface. So you say compassion. So where is it? What did Prabhupada say to show his compassionate mood? Someone else? Yeah, Maharaj when uh, when it said like uh, interpretate Bhagavad Gita without any reference to the will of Krishna. So here it is compassion that Prabhupada is revealing. I'm not quite following you, Prabhu. Can you tell me again? What is this compassion? Yeah, it's interpreted Bhagavad Gita without any reference to the will of Krishna. Uh, one of the para it's in a brief is so it's but it's I don't know I don't know that I don't see how that's compassion. I don't quite relate to that as being compassion. That certainly we don't want to in, interpret the message of the Bhagavad Gita, but uh, I don't quite relate that to compassion. Can we hear from someone else? Yes? Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada's mood, uh, sorry, mission is reflected in the one of the last few sentences. It is said that even if one person becomes a pure devotee, then, the, uh, then it will uh, that it will be, he will consider it as a success, the attempt as success. Okay. So his mission is to make pure devotees, but I think from this sentence it also shows his humility, which is his boat that he is not thinking that uh, whole world will become Krishna conscious, rather he is thinking just one person, even if it becomes that, he will consider it uh, as a satisfied end. Okay, yes, that's a mission that Prabhupada certainly wanted to make devotees. Make any, if even one person becomes a devotee, he considers his mission is successful. So, you know, he knew Krishna consciousness is not for everyone. But he wanted to see at least some people somewhere. He knew there's some people there who will take and take it up, who would be interested. Okay. So then, one, one sentence, Maharaj, where we can understand the compassion is everyone should know that a living entity is eternally a servant and that unless one serves Krishna, one has to serve illusion in different varieties of three modes of middle age and thus wander perpetually within the circle of birth and death. So this is where he is saying that if you don't uh, understand this Bhagavad Gita and understand Krishna is supreme, you have to perpetually go through this life and birth. That's why I see compassion. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, Maharaj, uh, there is this uh, line where uh, Prabhupada says that Krishna consciousness movement, uh, it is just above what Prabhupada just spoke, is essential in human society because it is often the highest perfection of life. And then he says uh, it is how unfortunate that the mundane wranglers have taken Bhagavad Gita for their demoniac pro propensities. So he, want to, he wants to remove the wrong interpretations of Bhagavad Gita and put it in the right picture. Okay. So is that mode or mission? So uh, it's both, uh, Maharaj. So first, the mood is that uh, the wrong uh, kind of uh, definition shouldn't go. That is the mood and uh, the mission is to present it in the right way. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uncompromising is another mood, Maharaj. Where Prabhupada is not compromising uh, the instructions of Bhagavad Gita. He's giving them as it is, as Krishna is presenting you, other than many other interpreters who have changed. Uh, the, the compromise of the giving of a, Can you give me give me the quote from the preface? Right? It, certainly Prabhupada is uncompromising, didn't compromise on the message of Bhagavad Gita. We want to know where where exactly in is it in the in Prabhupada's preface, where Prabhupada is revealing this mood of not compromising. Yeah, 
the result of such a blunder will be that the misguidance of Bhagavad Gita will certainly be prevented on the path of spiritual guidance and will not go, be able to go back home back to Godhead. So he gives all the other uncompromised commentaries, including Mayavadis, and then he states that if one if, if one we commit such a blunder, then everybody is taking, and then he says that only on, our only purpose is to present Bhagavad Gita as it is in order to guide the conditioned student to the same purpose for which Krishna descends to this planet once in a day of Brahma. So this purpose uh, is what Krishna, uh, Prabhupada is stating in the third paragraph, third, fourth paragraph. All right. So, so is this is this mission or mood? Uncompromised mood, Maharaj. Okay. All right. Thank you. Your voice is not clear, Prabhu. You have to speak up. I don't know something wrong with your mic, maybe. Okay, is it better now, Maharaj? Not much. Okay, so this is point, and because we are not polluting the theme of Bhagavad Gita as it is, and he was seriously interested in deriving benefit. So he uses this word, we are not polluting the theme. Uh huh. We're not polluting the theme. And what was the second part? Uh, the second part is uh, just a second. Uh, because we're not polluting, so anyone seriously interested in deriving benefit by studying the Bhagavad Gita must take help from the Krishna Consciousness Movement for practical understanding of Bhagavad Gita mm -hmm. under the guidance of Lord. Okay. So. How would you place this as? Mood or mission? Yes. What? Mood, mood or mission? Which one? <laughs> it, it feels kind of mixed, Maharaj. Uh, Prabhupada's mood gets converted into his mission also. <laughs> so, a little difficult to distinguish between both. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, yeah, second part is talking about the society, that you have to become a member of the society. Mm -hmm. Initially, maybe it was more the mood, but then he went more into the mission. Okay. Any other points? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Maharaj, one of the mission of uh, Prabhupada here is that uh, to bring in front of the conditioned soul the purpose for which Lord Krishna descended. He writes that in order to guide the conditioned students to the same purpose for which Lord Krishna descends. Okay. So, mood or mission? Mission, mission, Maharaj. Yes. We want people to understand Krishna's reason in coming into this world. Okay, thank you. Any more reasons? Any more points? Yep, certainly, Prabhupada's preface is very... Uh, full of meaning and his, Prabhupada is revealing his own mood and what he wants to achieve in presenting Bhagavad Gita. He'd waited a long time. So Prabhupada's preface is setting the scene for people coming in to study Bhagavad Gita. Certainly it opens the doors. A lot of people, they may read, that Bhagav, may, may read that preface and they don't pick up on that mood and mission. It's important for us to actually understand Prabhupada's deep feelings which he had in presenting that Bhagavad Gita. How much he was really thinking and praying to Krishna that he could begin this Krishna consciousness movement and open the eyes to peop of people, let them understand. Of course, Bhagavad Gita is only the preliminary phase, it's only the first step in the spiritual knowledge. But that's, that's the beginning, it's very important. Okay, we'll go ahead, let's see. From Prabhupada's preface, our only purpose is to present the Bhagavad Gita as it is in order to guide the conditioned soul to the same purpose for which Krishna descends to this planet once in the day of Brahma. Right, I think you already picked out that quote. 
Instead of satisfying his own personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. The Lord wants this and he demands it. One has to understand this central point of Bhagavad Gita. Our Krishna consciousness movement is teaching the whole world this central point. Hmm? So Prabhupada very powerfully explains here his uh, mission and you, as, as the devotee also meant you can feel a bit also Prabhupada's mood that Krishna wants this, he demands it. <laughs> very powerful. <laughs> So, and our Krishna consciousness movement is teaching this. So, very wonderful. So, Prabhupada's mood and mission to help students understand and appreciate the mood and mission of Srila Prabhupada and to perpetuate that understanding within the ISKCON society. Now, as we go through Bhagavad Gita, we'll come across several purports and in the same mood, which bring out Prabhupada's mood and mission. And it's good to note these different purports because you may like to use them sometimes when you're presenting essays or in your own preaching work. Prabhupada's mood and mission, how Prabhupada writes, he writes his purports in such a way to help us to uh, fully enter into this mood of the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so we'll, we'll go into chapter 1 now. So the Sanskrit name of this first chapter, Vishada Yoga. Who knows, what's the meaning, Vishada? Lamentation. Yeah, like that, isn't it? Yoga of lamentation. Knowledge that is manifested by considering one's body as the self or soul is called Vishada Yoga. When a conditioned soul considers his body as the self, then he thinks, Deha Dharma, Jati Dharma, Kula Dharma, Arya Dharma, etc. as Sanatan religious prin principles and he becomes puzzled by lamentation, illusion, fearfulness. So Vishada Yoga, identifying with the body. material life, conditioned life. So the first verse of Bhagavad Gita, very well known. O Sanjay, after my sons and the sons of Pandu assembled in the place of pilgrimage at Kurukshetra, desiring to fight, what did they do? Right? Who's speaking? Dhritarashtra. Yes, Dhritarashtra is speaking. And he's asking Sanjay, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do? So in, in the purport, what point does Prabhupada bring out? In the purport, do you remember? How, how, what does Prabhupada say about Dhritarashtra? What's his fault? Anyone? Mama Mamaka, he is basically uh, me consciousness, he is dividing his and his uh, Pandu's sons. Right. His sons and Pandu's sons. Right, that's correct, right. Dhritarashtra is thinking that my sons are different from the sons of Pandu. Actually, they're the same family. They're all from the Kuru 
dynasty, but Dhritarashtra has separated them, my sons and the sons of Pandu. And Pandu was his brother. So, this is the unfortunate consciousness of Dhritarashtra. And he want, he's inquiring, what, what did they do? Did they fight? He's worried. What, what, what's Dhritarashtra's worry, actually? Does he want them to fight or does he not want them to fight? Yeah, he wants them to fight. Why is he asking, what did they do? What does he think, that, what does he think they're going to do? What's he worried about? He was worried, he was worried about the Dharma Kshetra being the land of Dharma might have changed somebody's mind and the fight might have stopped. That's what he was worried about. Right, yeah, he's thinking, well, maybe they won't fight. Maybe they, they'll just, uh, you know, be, make a peaceful adjustment, to settle, settle everything peacefully. So he didn't really want that to happen. He wanted that they should, they should fight. They'd already tried everything, but Duryodhan was determined to fight and Dhritarashtra didn't, didn't see any reason not to fight. So they've come together in this place, Dharma Kshetra, place of Dharma. A holy place, a religious place. They've come there to fight. It's unusual that they would choose such a place. Uh, to settle their family quarrel, they have to go to the holy place, not to just simply do yajna, but to fight and to kill. And so many crores of people are going to die. So this is Kurukshitra, Dharmakshitra. In the purport, Prabhupada gives the analogy, as in the paddy field, the unnecessary plants are taken out. In the religious field of Kurukshitra, unwanted plants like Dhritarashtra's son, Duryodhan and others would be wiped out. So, growing rice, <laughs> unwanted plants have to be pulled out, right? If you're growing your, if you've got your paddy field, you certainly want to get out all those weeds. They're going to choke the growth of the plants. So, Dhritarashtra's sons, such as Duryodhana and others, they're all going to be removed at this Kurukshitra. Right. Mamaka and Pandava, right? the sons of Pandu. Alright, so the, then that's the first verse. Then we go on to hear about Duryodhana's diplomacy. Because Dhritarashtra had asked, what did my sons do? So Sanjay is describing to Dhritarashtra what his sons are actually doing. So Sanjay is describing how Duryodhana is using his diplom diplomatic uh, ability to stir the minds of his army. He wants all of his great generals. Who are the ones on Duryodhana's side? Who's, who's the head of his army? Bishma. Who? Bhishma. 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 Bhishma is there, and who's el who else is there? Dronacharya. Drona. Drona, right. Drona and Bhishma. And who else is there when these two fall? Karn. Karna. Karn, right. Karna, right. Oh, all right. So he's got some great generals there. And so Duryodhan is a little worried about. What may happen is, is said, stated here, uh, Oh my teacher, oh my teacher, who's his teacher? Drona Charanda. Drona's a teacher, right? Drona was a teacher of both the Kauravas and the Pandavas. He taught them 
the military arts. So, O oh my teacher, behold the great army of the sons of Pandu, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. So, Mariji, can you tell us more? Who is the son of Drupada? Drista Jumna. right. And so, what has Drista Jumna done? Which side is he on? The Pandava side. And what's he done? He's arranged the army of the Pandavas against the Kauravas. So, why is Duryodhan mentioning this? Why is it because yes? Drupada and uh, uh, Drona were enemies, and he was inciting the anger of Drona by reciting that uh, the disciple, the son of Drupada, by reciting his name Drupada, so that his anger comes out, so that he he doesn't bother about that his own uh, disciples are there in front of him. Why does Drona have to be particularly worried about the son of Drupada? He, he taught him Drupada. Huh? He only taught him knowing him, knowing that Drupada, Drupada's son, Drishtadrumna, was the son of his enemy, knowing that also Dronacharya taught Drishtadrumna. He is the guru of Drishtadrumna. Right. So Drona taught him, so why is he why should he worry about him? That's because Maharaj, uh, in particular, uh Drishtadrumna had taken birth uh, basically come out of the yagya to kill Dronacharya. So he was, Dronacharya knew that he will be the cause of his death, even though uh, he taught him and uh, that is how he is inciting, uh, uh, Duryodhana is inciting Dronacharya. Who did the yagya? So, sorry, Maharaj? Who did the yagya? Who did the yagya? You said he came out of the yagya. Who was doing Dropada. the yagya? Dropada, right. Dropada was doing the yagya. Why? The main reason of doing Yajna was to produce a child who can kill Dronacharya. Why did Drupad want to kill Dronacharya? Actually, uh, Drupada uh, hmm. promised uh, uh, Drona. Uh, Drona uh, promised to uh, Drupada that he will give half of his kingdom uh, when they were friends in the uh, Gurukula. But uh, later, uh, Drona. Uh, uh, refused to give. So that's why they become uh, uh, enemies and then it is. Well, they were friends in the Gurukula, yes, and he promised that he would help him. But later on, after they left Gurukula, when uh, Dronacharya was very poor, he came to Drupad to meet him and Drupad didn't accept him as friends. He said, friendship is only possible between equals. He said, you're not, you're not equal, we're not equals, I cannot accept you as my friend. So it was a great insult to Drona. So then Drona went to the palace of Hastinapur and he, cha he trained the, he became the teacher of the Kauravas and the Pandavas. And then he, after he trained them, then he told them, now you go and challenge Maharaj Dropada to battle. And they went there and they defeated Dropada and they captured him and they brought him as a prisoner and placed him at the feet of uh, Dronacharya. And then Dronacharya told Dropada, he said, okay, he said, now I'm going to take, I won't, I won't take all your kingdom, but I'll take half of it. And he took half of the kingdom away from Dropada and sent him back. And so Dropada was very bitter about it. And so he did a yagya and at that time, who was born in the Yagya? Dropadi. Dropadi, right. Dropadi is born from the Yagya and also Drista Jumna. So Drista Jumna was born, to t t his purpose in taking birth was to bring about the death of Drona. But at the same time, what do we learn about Drona's nature? What do we see? Who, who, who was the teacher of Dr Drista Jumna? Dronacharya. Drona was a, so Dronacharya was his teacher, but he knew this, this, this person is born to kill me, but still he accepted him as his disciple and he trained him to fight. 
So what does this tell us about Drona? What do you Brahmana. mean? It's a broad-minded Brahmana nature. Yeah, what, what particular quality of the Brahmana? Uh, equal to everybody. Equal. Samadarshi. Samadarshi. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Check. Okay. That he's, he had that vision that he, he, he didn't distinguish who's friend or enemy. He didn't think, well, he's going to kill me. He said, well, if he's going to kill me, what can... Anyway, it's, I'm a Brahmana. It's my duty to teach him. So the benevolent nature of a Brahmana, that they have knowledge, they'll share it, even with their enemy. Whatever they have, they will share. They won't think, oh, I'm not going to give you what I, I'm, I... I'm going to keep it for myself. That's not Brahmana. The Brahmana, whatever they have, they're set, they are willing to sacrifice for others. So Drona showed that benevolent nature of the Brahmana by teaching, by accepting Drishta Jumna as his disciple. And uh, Duryodhana not, knew this and therefore he's pointing it out to Drona and he's warning him here that look, just see this army, this is arranged by your disciple, the son of Dropada, the one who's born to kill you. So you have to really look out. You know someone's born to kill you, certainly you're going to Want to be? You want to be careful about that? Okay. Drupada putrena tava shishena dimata. Drupada, yeah, the son of Drupada, your disciple, dimata. Hmm. Okay. Prabhupada talks about it. Brahmana is liberal. Dronacharya knew that Drupad Maharaj has got his son. In future. He would kill me. Still, when he was offered to become his disciple, to learn military art, he accepted. Yes, that means the brahmanas were so liberal. When he is coming as my disciple, never mind. He would kill me in future, doesn't matter. But I must give him teaching. So, brahmanas have that liberality. All right, so then going ahead we hear about Arjuna and he has certain celestial weapons, powerful weapons given to him by different personalities. And Bhima, he's made some vows. Anybody knows anything about the weapons Arjuna has or the vows Bhima took? Maharaj, uh, Arjuna had Pashupat Astra. Yes. And he had Brahmastra. Yes. What what bow did he have? Sorry, Maharaj. What was his bow? His bow. Gandiva. His bow was Gandiva. Right. Given by Agni Dev. Okay. Very good. And do you know about Bhima's vows? Yes, Maharaj. He vowed to kill all hundred sons of uh, the, um, the Dhritarashtra and he vowed that he will uh, uh, specifically break the thighs of uh, uh, Duryodhan and give blood so that uh, Draupadi can tie her hair again. Uh, this. Uh, Dushasha's blood, Dushasha's blood, so uh, he can, she can tie her hair again. Yeah, where, where's he going to get Dushasha's blood from? His chest, like ripping apart his chest. Yeah, rip out his heart and give the blood for Draupadi to wash her hair in the blood. Why? Why did Draupadi want to do that? Because she was a chaste lady who was, her hair was touched uh, by uh, this uh, chaste lady's hair, nobody can touch, but they were in, uh, touched by uh, this uh, Dushashan. So just, she was dragged through her hair in the Kuru assembly where they were gambling and also. 
And why did, why did Bhim want to break the tie of Duryodhan? Because he had indicated like her Draupadi yeah. to sit there like. Yes, right. Okay, very good. Right. Maharata, number six. One who can fight with 10,000 archers and skillful in the knowledge of scripture and weapon. Maharatis. Hmm. <laughs> uh, we had a devotee. There was one devotee called Maharati Das. He was from Germany. Uh, <laughs> Very interesting because when he got initiation, uh, Prabhupada asked him, what, what were you doing before you became a devotee? And the devotee said, he said, Prabhupada, I was working in a slaughterhouse. So Prabhupada thought, oh, just see, from the slaughterhouse, now you have come to Krishna consciousness. There is the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada gave him that name, Maharati. So, Dvijya, Uttama, best of the Brahmanas. Oh, best of the, mentioned in number seven, oh, best of the Brahmanas. Who is this? Who is this Dvijya? Who are the Dvijya? Who is Dvijya Uttama? Text number seven. Maharaj, uh, Dvija uh, stands for like, uh, we are twice born, we used to say. Yes, Dvija means twice born. Brahmanas are all Dvija. And this is Uttama, the best of the Brahmanas. So who's, who's, who is being referred to in that particular text? Dronacharya Maharaj. I think so, yeah. I don't know who are any other Brahmanas who are taking part in the battle. Uh, Kripacharya. Kripacharya. Oh, Kripacharya is there, of course, right? Yeah, Kripacharya is also, two teachers are there. Mm -hmm. Samgyana Artam, for information. Okay. So this is all Duryodhana speaking. He's mentioning the names of different people who are there. On his side, he wants to encourage his different soldiers. He wants them all to feel important. Bhavan Bhishmas Chakarnascha, right? So Bhishma and Karna, and then Kripa, Ashvatama, Vikarn. He mentions all their names. He wants to encourage them, make them feel. Even Vikarn is not a very great fighter, but he wants to encourage him by mentioning his names. So Duryodhan shows his diplomacy. He's very intelligent person, very skillful, and he's, he has to speak in such a way to encourage his uh, army and at the same time warn them about the different dangers. Mm. And he, he glorifies them, mentioned here, madarte chakta jivita, who are prepared to lay down their lives for my sake. So he understands the nature of all these great Kshatriyas, that they've come there, they're ready to die on the battlefield. Why? Simply because Duryodhana has requested them. He's requested them to fight on his side. Okay, so Duryodhana is certainly very diplomatic and, and wants to encourage his army, just like if you were and, you know, playing a, a ball game like whatever, football or cricket or something, then you'll have the team manager, he'll come and he, he'll, he'll in, wants to speak to point out the dangers. You have to watch that person and you have to, you know, remember this person and different points. He'll warn the, his side what they have to take care of, what they have to use for their advantage. So, do you done? He wants to warn them of the dangers and at the same time point out the advantages. The advantages are they have great generals like Bhishma, Karna, Kripa, 
And the dangers are, well, people like uh, Drona, that he, the Drishti Jumna has taken birth to kill him. So he has to be careful. And then we have the Pandavas on the other side, and, and they're also powerful warriors. They're very great, powerful fighters. Then they have people like Bhima. And so they have to be very much uh, careful on the battlefield. So text number 10, aparyaptam tad asmakam and paryaptam twaidam etasam. Would someone like to tell me what's been meant, what's the point here? Text number 10, aparyaptam and paryaptam. What's the point? Immeasurable and measurable Maharaj. All right. So we sing aparyaptam, Bhishma as perfection is aparyaptam, it's immeasurable, whereas Bhima is considering as measurable, not, not so vast, not so great as Bhishma in protecting their Anuvas. He is comparing with Bhishma and Bhima. Mm, okay. So, he's, he's trying to encourage them anyway. Actually, Grandfather Bhishma, you could say, well, he's so old, but he has, he's very powerful, he's a great fighter. He's also Maharati. He's saying this, this strength is immeasurable. Is it really immeasurable? Well, not really. And Bhima, his, str his strength is really measurable. Bhima is also very powerful. Anyway, so anyway, Duryodhan wants to encourage his side. It's his diplomatic nature to speak this way to encourage the, his sight. So he's speaking like that. So a quote from Prabhupada, Nirbanda Krishna Sambande. So people may ask that by mentioning these great fighters, what spiritual progress we make? Because we are meant for chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So by chanting the names of these great fighters, what do we gain? The question may be raised there. But the thing is that Nirbanda Krishna Sambandi, whenever there is connection with Krishna, that also becomes Krishna. So these warriors name mentioning, we should not neglect. Krishna wanted to gather all the demoniac power in that battlefield of Kurukshetra and kill them. That was his plan. Nirbandha Krishna Sambandhi, everything in relation to Krishna, right? Because it's in Krishna Sambandhi, it's in connection with Krishna. So these names are not to be neglected, Prabhupada said. It's a difficult thing when we translate these uh, books, when we put them into other languages, these names are very difficult for people. Sometimes we get problems. All these names, Sanskrit names. But Prabhupada is saying here anyway that they're in relation to Krishna. And they were important people in their time. And Krishna gathered them all there, let them all be killed. That was his plan. Text number 11. All of you must now give full support to Grandfather Bhishma as you stand at your respective strategic points of entrance into the phalanx of the army. So, this is uh, Duryodhan encouraging his army to support Grandfather Bhishma when they go into the battlefield. Why was Duryodhan confident of full support of Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya? Anyone like to offer a suggestion? Why was Duryodhana so confident of their support? But, sir, previously also they did not uh, uh, 
basically they did not say anything when the draupadi uh, this thing disrobing of the draupadi happened so at that time also they did not object anything bishma dev and dronacharya so might be that duryodhan is thinking that are on his side and then they will support him yes this time also right right uh duryodhan we may consider that you know certainly bishma dev has some partiality he has some like and dronacharya also dronacharya's number one student was arjuna he had the full blessings of dronacharya and arjuna was really dear to dronacharya and grandfather bishma had so much love for the pandavas but still duryodhan's confident that on the battlefield that bishma and drona will give their full might to fight on his behalf against the pandavas so one reason for this is prabhu said that they had they had not said anything to oppose when they had disrobed when they made the attempt to disrobe draupadi they had not voiced any disapproval so that was certainly black mark against them and because of this duryodhan was confident of their so full support they'd been also caring they'd been brought up they'd been living in the palace under the maintenance of duryodhan so they were pretty much obliged to duryodhan they had to take part when it came to the battle they couldn't really go and fight for the pandavas because they've already been living there so many years it spent there with duryodhan in the palace being maintained by him so when it came to the battle they had to fight on his side also and their kshatriyas Kshat, for kshatriyas it's glorious to die on the battlefield so duryodhan is pretty confident that bishma and drona are going to give full support Prabhupada explains he was confident of the of the full support of Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya in the battle because he knew well that they did not even speak a word when Arjuna's wife Draupadi in her helpless condition had appealed to them for justice while she was being forced to appear naked in the presence of the great generals in the assembly so that was the Uh, the fault of Bhishma and Drona, and that's why they had to die on the battlefield. Also, Krishna wanted that they should be killed. They have to leave. Then, uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, can I ask one question? Okay. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Bhagavad Gita starts from. dharma kshetra or on the name of dharma uh, it it uh, have uh, it is talking about krishna is talking about the soul level but uh, uh, great uh, great people like uh, drona and bhishma who were very enlightened very uplifted uh, in uh, devotees and how they were uh, uh, obliged on the level of on the bodily level uh, to to duryodhana because when on one side we are talking about dharma krishna and sol and bhishma and drona were very uplifted and how they get it to uh, the bodily level of well it's their sense of duty the sen- because of their sense of duty as kshatriyas simply based on their sense of duty as kshatriyas that they have a duty to fight it doesn't really matter which side they fight on that wasn't important to them what was important is that they fight that they d- did their duty they were requested to fight on the side of duryodhan they could not refuse and they they took up the service and do it to the best of their ability so that was that was executing dharma for the kshatriya to fighting on the battlefield certainly they want to show their valor show their courage 
It doesn't matter which side you're fighting on. But Maharaj, how can we say it doesn't matter? Uh, uh, because it matters when, when they are fighting uh, uh, on the side of Duryodhana. That means they are giving the side of Adharma. And if they are Kshatriya, then they have their dharma is to fight, then they can fight from the side of Arjuna also. Then also they are executing their dharma of Kshatriya. Well, you could, not from the you could see, side. you can see, for example, like Bhishma Dev, he was enjoying more than Arjuna because he was able to see directly Lord Krishna. Arjuna, he had to be behind Krishna. Krishna was his charioteer. He couldn't really see Krishna. Or either either Krishna was in front or Krishna was behind, but he, he or Krishna was behind him. Arjuna was in front. Arjuna was fighting Krishna. He he couldn't really see Krishna because Krishna was his charioteer. But Bhishma, he was able to actually see Lord Krishna directly, and. It was a, a very intimate rasa which he was having with the Lord Krishna. He was firing arrows which were like flower offerings to Lord Krishna. So in, in that way you could see Bhishma was having greater loving exchange than Arjuna. Arjuna was taking service from Krishna but he wasn't able to actually visualize, he wasn't able to see Krishna because of the nature of the arrangement, that he's the charioteer. But Bhishma, Grandfather Bhishma, he could see Krishna. When he was enjoying, he was seeing Krishna. His offering, his arrows were offerings, offered with love to Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. All right, so there are different signs of victory. Encouraging, encouragement for the Pandavas, we see in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the next section of the Bhagavad Gita describes different signs of victory. Festival of fighting by Pandavas. Madhava. Who is Madhava? Husband of, of Goddess of Lakshmi. Yeah, the, the husband of the goddess of fortune, right? And where is he on the battlefield? Krishna, riding the chariot of Arjuna. Right, he's the charioteer of Arjuna. So, that's something very much in the favor of the Pandavas, that they have the blessings of the goddess of fortune through the presence of Lord Krishna. Because Lord Krishna is there, so the Goddess of Fortune is also bestowing her blessings on them. And then Divya Shankal, Divya Shankam, uh, takes 14, these conch shells, the divine conch shells, the sound of the conch shells. What's the name of Krishna's conch shell? And what's the name of Arjuna's conch shell? David. David. Right. Hmm. And what happens when they blow their conch shell? Shatters the hearts like lion. Shatters the hearts of Kauravas. Shatters the hearts of the Kauravas, right. That's it. Another factor in the favor of the Pandavas? Arjuna has a very special, indestructible chariot given to him by the, sun, the fire god Agni. Very special chariot. And that makes a big difference. You have a good chariot. Hmm. So you're going in the, into the battlefield, you want to be well prepared. So the chariot is very helpful. And then Kapi Dvija. Who's on the flag of Arjun? Anuman. And what's the significance? That, you know, when Ram, Lord Ram had fight with uh, Ravana, so Hanuman was there uh, as a sign of Lord Ram victory. So same sign is here also, which is showing that 
Pandava's victory. Yes, Arjuna is praying. Prabhupada talks about the previous Acharyas. So Hanuman is the previous Acharya in fighting. And Arjuna is seeking the blessings of Hanuman, the previous Acharya in fighting. That please bless me as you fought for Lord Ram. Bless me that I can also fight for Lord Krishna. Prabhupada explains this is Vaishnavism. So in the fighting principle, Arjuna is fighting for Krishna. He's following the previous fighting Acharya, Hanumanji. Therefore, he has depicted his flag with Hanuman. That Hanumanji, Bajranga ji, kindly help us, kindly help me. This is Vaishnavism. I have come here to fight for Lord Krishna. You fought also for the Lord. Kindly help me. This is the idea, Kapidvaja. So any activities of the Vaishnava, they should always pray to the previous Acharya. Kindly help me, kindly. This is Vaishnava. This, this is, Vaishnava is always thinking himself helpless, helpless and begging help from the previous Acharya. Can you give some other examples? Thinking somebody thought themselves helpless and they pray for the help from the previous Acharya? Maharaj Krishnadas Kaviraj uh, Maharaj, he, he prayed uh, to all the Acharyas when he was writing, before writing the Chaitanya Charita Amrita. Yes. Who did he pray to? Srila Prabhupada Maharaj. Who did, wait, we're not finished yet. Who did Krishna Das Kaviraj pray to? He prayed to all the six Goswamis. He prayed to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu as well. And the whole parampara like. Well, we, we see in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it describes he went, first he prayed to Madan Mohan. Right? He went to Madan Mohan, prayed to the deities there. And then, like that, he was praying to the deities, and, and then Govinda Gopinath, he was praying to the deities. And certainly he prays also Rupa Raghunath, following in their footsteps at the end of the each chapter. He said, following in the footsteps of Rupa and Raghunath, praying for their mercy, because he had heard from them about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And, said, and he was also thinking himself very helpless and unqualified. He said, Jagai madai haiti munishe papishta purushera kita haiti munishe lagista. I am lower than Jagai and Madhai. I am lower than a worm in stool. Anyone who utters my name, they lose their pious activities. Anyone who sees me, they, they become sinful. Like this, helpless, he was very helpless. So begging help from the previous Acharyas. So this is the system, this is, Prabhupada said, this is Vaishnava. Okay. So, you were saying Srila Prabhupada also? The Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. So what happened? Srila. Srila Prabhupada, before started his preaching, uh, he stayed in Radha Damoda temple in Vrindavan under the shelter of Srila Rupa Goswami Samadhi. So he was praying to Srila Rupa Goswami. Yes. Also, before he went to America, he went to Shantipur. And he went to Shantipur and he prayed to Advaita Acharya. He went there uh, several times to Shantipur, praying Advaita Acharya. Sorry, what did you say? He also went to Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur's place in Delhi. Yeah, he went to Bhaktisiddhanta to his Guru, Guru Maharaj's, to pray his Guru Maharaj. Where? 
Actually, Pra Prabhupada didn't go to the Samadhi of his Guru Maharaj very much at all. He didn't like it. He didn't like it. He said they collected a lot of money, they didn't build a very big Samadhi. And he said they, they didn't make it big. Good. One time they actually had the God, some of the God brothers, they came to Prabhupada and they asked him, why you don't come to see the Guru Maharaj's Samadhi? And Prabhupada told him, he said he didn't like it. He said he thought it didn't look like his Guru Maharaj. And he said didn't he said he didn't build a very grand one. And he, that, oh, he was such a great spiritual master that he didn't build a very big samadhi. And he said, anyway, he said, my spiritual master is always by my side. I do not think of him as simply being under the ground. He said, he is always by my side, leading me. In Jalatuta, Maharaj, he prayed the very, he uh, asked uh, his uh, Guru Maharaj, prayed that let his words be, uh, change the hearts of those he is going to preach before he went on to preaching in the Okay. Okay, so there is two missions not only to give protection to the devotees, but also to kill the demons. So the devotees of Krishna should be trained up both ways. Not only to give protection to the devotees, to give them encouragement, but if need be, they should be prepared to kill the demons. That is Vaishnavism. All right? So, consider ways this quote may be misused. You must have already done this exercise last week. So you can quickly tell me some ways this quote may be misused. The consequences. Right? Did you do this exercise last week? No, no Maharaj. No, Maharaj. You, uh, you, you didn't? No. Well, then you have to do it today. So we have to make some groups. How many people have we got? 18, Maharaj. Okay. So uh, six groups of three. Haribo? Yagna Prabhu? Yes, three groups of six, right, Maharaj? Huh? Three groups of six uh, people, right? No, six, six groups of three. Six groups of three. Okay, six groups of three. Okay, we'll give you five, five, five minutes to discuss this. Shall I open now? Yes, open the groups now. We'll go back to the quote here. Here's the quote. Is it clear? Okay, you clear what you have to do, Prabhu?
I can't hear anything. Shakshi, is it Shakshi Gopal? Is it? Yeah? You understand the question? You understand the question? You have no heart. Huh? You don't under you don't understand the question? No heart. Ash can get the quote again. Yes. Okay, let me go back. This meeting is being recorded. Yagna, I have to show the screen. I have to show the PowerPoint. All right. Oh, wait. Here's the quote. No, Maharaj, they, are, uh, they all are in the groups. Oh. Now somebody asked me, they said they wanted to see the quote. Oh. One devotee told me he didn't understand the question. Sorry, manage. Someone else told me they didn't understand the question. They did not okay. understand. Someone did not understand the question. Get everybody out of the groups, bring them all back. Okay. Hare Krishna, everyone back? Yes, yes, Maharaj. All right, now everyone see the quote here is on the screen. Can you see it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Right, you all know the quote, you're familiar with it now? Yes, Maharaj. They should be prepared to kill the demons. And you are, you are asked, you are asked, consider ways this quote may be misused. Two or three different ways this quote may be misused. And then you are also, discuss the consequences of the misuse. And we want to hear your best example. Is everyone clear the question what you have to do? Yes, Maharaj. All right, so we'll give you five minutes to discuss this with your group. Shall we open rooms now, Maharaj? Yes, put back in the room. Uh, Prabhuji. So now you clear Shakshi Gopal? Yes, Maharaj. I cannot hear you. Yeah, I cannot hear on the You are you are muted, Prabhuji. Okay. 
Okay, so you can start discussing. First of all, thank you, Prabhuji, for giving us this opportunity to have association of Maharaji. And we are really fortunate to have association uh, of Maharaji and association. No, no, no. Okay, we'll talk this later. We have less time for you to task. So, Sadhguru Mataji, please enlighten us. I want to hear from you. You have to do the work, not me. Think about this question. This meeting is being recorded. The recording has stopped. I mean chat. Maharaji, can we have that uh, question in our chat, chat box? No. There's not enough time now to put it in the chat box. You have to rem We'll put it in the chat box at the end of the class. But you should remember the point, the main point of the question. I just simply want to know about killing demons. This meeting is being recorded. Jihad, I'll just put it as Jihad. Jihad is another point. The third point we discussed, sorry. The third point we discussed is, uh, is the other way, right? If we protect devotees, devotees, uh, even for their mistakes. Yeah. This meeting is being recorded. Tag Mataji, we can add points here. Maharaj just came to our room. Yes, yes. yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj also is there in the room. Hare Krishna Hare. Prabhu. Hare Krishna. He was listening. He was listening. So are you okay? You're getting, you come up with some ideas? Yes, Maharaj. Three points we came up with. We very very good. Okay. You're group six, huh? Okay. This meeting is being recorded. problems that could even cause some uh, killing or physically some uh, uh, issues there. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Have you come up with Hare some Krishna. points? Yes Maharaj. We... Yes, we tried. This started, started Maharaj actually. Okay. Good. So one thing is, well, you know, I was just discussing with Mataji. So the first point is that one of the points that Mataji said that we can misinterpret this while preaching. 
Uh, and the second point that I was suggesting is we may have, you know, the fight among devotees. We can use this quotation as a base and then, you know, we might fight, we might have fight among devotees. Like, for example, if we are trying to preach someone and to the person whom we are trying to preach or if we are trying to bring a devotee a level up and if he's not coming, then we might be very offensive towards that devotee. So, you know, the killing over here doesn't mean literal killing uh, word. Even, you know, doing Vaishnav Ninda is a form of, you know, killing because by doing so, we are killing our spiritual position. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so we'll hear about this when we come, let everybody get back together as a group and we'll hear from you. Okay, we can call, close This meeting is being recorded. Close the groups, Prabhu. Get everybody back. Okay. Everyone is back, mm, Everyone back? Yes. Okay, so let's start from group number six. Group number six, who's your spokesman? Yes, Prabhu. So, our points were on that uh, misunderstanding would be that that we see ourselves as devotees and everybody who is not chanting or is outside of our community is automatically a demon and not understand that the demon can be inside of our hearts also. The demon is something which is inside of us and others. And that um, that we can, um, if we think like that, that they are demons and we are devotees or demigods or whatever, then we want to start a fight with them. And then this is the jihad, which is also kind of known as this, uh, which something can happen. Um, and uh, also about the protection that we have to be careful how we protect something. If we think, okay, we have to protect the devotees, um, we have to be careful because devotees also make mistakes because we also have low beings inside of us and then protect the devotee who even made maybe a big mistake. And um, this can lead to a fight in between, like in a devotee community. Because we protect the wrong devotee, we become uh, we could be happy. And then um, also the way we protect the devotee, I guess it's kind of the same point. We have to be careful what we're protecting. Are we protecting the person or are we trying to protect the, the devotion of that person? We should actually try to protect the, the um, because otherwise if we, we can like go harsh on someone trying to protect that person, but that and then slowly that person, that devotee is losing interest or losing inspiration and slowly slipping off in Krishna consciousness. They should try to protect their devotion and not the person as a as a human body, but as a just a yeah, devotion. Okay. And, and how do you see the consequences of this uh misinterpretation or this interpretation what 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 do you th consider would be the result you know how's it I going guess, yeah i guess this um it's like yeah this this making groups of, of this war kind of this this closing big um like we are devotees and their demons this this uh this understanding of, of there will be some i don't know it's going some some we will be a close society and they are kind of demons and we don't interact. There is no, they're all like that. There no, they cannot preach and be going on like that. But they will be too harsh and then the preaching will not be effective. It will not be, mm, it will be yeah. we cannot kill their demons inside the heart like that. Okay, good. Thank you. 
All right. So uh, let's hear from some other group. Do you have uh, some different points, maybe? Group number three. Group, group number three, who is the spokesman? Yagna Dinishta Prabhu, who is it, who is it, who were in group number three? There were ladies there. Oh, oh yeah, Pankaja Lochan Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Now, did you, did you hear Prabhu's points? Did you hear what he was saying, the different points he made? Hare Krishna, are you there? Yes, Maharaj. Were you able to hear the points which were put by the other group? Yes, 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 Maharaj. Do you have different points or the same points? A little bit different. Okay, let's hear. So, first of all, what this statement means is not only to give protection but also to kill the demon. It means while we are preaching or while we are having our association with devotees, attraction with devotees, we should not only give them uh, the protection but also the knowledge or the wisdom through which they can kill the demons within. And how we can misuse this statement is, again, you know, while preaching and while our interactions with devotees, for example, if you are trying to bring someone level up and if he's not, you know, running at our pace, or if we are trying to preach and we are not being successful, we might become very offensive towards the devotees. And over here, killing the demon doesn't mean literal killing. Being offensive means if we are doing a prat within the devotees or with devotees, then we are killing ourselves. Like we are, this is Vaishnava prat will kill our, all the, you know, what to say, it will bring us a level down. We will fall down from these states that we are. Okay. Yes, we have to be very careful. We don't want to be making Vaishnava Parat. We have to be kind to all living entities, right? Vaishnava means full of compassion for all the conditioned souls. So if we think of them as demons, then where is our compassion? Hmm? So what should our mood be towards the conditioned souls? Lord Pankaja, Lord Chan, Krishna Prabhu. We should always try to kill the demon that is within ourselves and with the knowledge we should try to encourage the devotees to kill the demon that is within themselves. How are we going to kill that demon? By proper understanding, by, by, by understanding the Shastra, by having proper uh, association and by for it like the Navada Bhakti, you know, it start with the Shraddha, then Sadhu, Sangha, uh, then Bhajan Kriya. So by this, we, by following gradually, by doing these processes, we can kill the demon. Ah, by giving spiritual knowledge, by the transmission of spiritual knowledge, we can take away the ignorance and change the demon. Demons can become devotees, right? Prabhupada made happies into happies. Right. Many people, many demons, jagai, many jagais and madhais became nice devotees. Okay, let's hear, we didn't hear from group number one. Hare 
right, Krishna Maharaj. So we discussed that uh, this uh, this particular statement can be misunderstood as extremism or like joining army or like terrorism. That uh, you know how uh, one uh, uh, sees that oh these are demons and these are devotees. So there is sort of discrimination. So one can think oh this is like a mission or a mood where demons are killed. Like there is extremism and there is violence. So that it is the way it can be misunderstood in that way as an extremism or or something like. Uh, so one of the religion where there are terrorists and all like Muslims generally, you know, hatred, they are preaching hatred through this, that uh, these people are worshippers and these people are uh, demoniac, like that's that's yeah. the way they, so they can be misunderstood in that way. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, that's good. I appreciate that. That's a good understanding, misinterpreting like that. Yeah. Good. Any other point, Johan? Uh, Maharaj, we have discussed the other points, uh, other groups have already, already discussed mentioned. the other points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you brought up these good points about fanaticism and even like terrorism, <laughs> yeah, very extreme. Yeah. So, of course, it, and it is taking place today. I mean, we see it going on around the world. These threats are there. It's a big influence in the world. So. We don't want to be lumped in in that manner, you know, we're just another terrorist group. <laughs> That's definitely not what we want. But at the same time we do want to preach, we do want to bring about some change in people by preaching, by the holy name. At one point uh, they were accusing, the, you know, when we first brought the devotees to India, there was some suspicion that these American devotees, they're CIA, you know, they're agents of the CIA because at that time there was some tension between India and Pakistan. And USA had taken sides with Pakistan and they were giving more support to Pakistan than to India. And so there was some suspicion that maybe these Hare Krishna people are CIA agents. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, pra Prabhupada said, yeah, we, yes, he said, we're going to conquer the world. And, the, you know, they were suspicious that m we must have political aims. And Prabhupada said, yes, we have political aims. He said, we're going to conquer the world by Rathiatra. We'll bring our chariots, our, our tanks up. The, the chariots, the Rathiatra chariots, that this way we will conquer the world. And you can see it happening, the Rathiatra festival is taking place around the world, how it, it's a festival of peace and people appreciate that. And even there was a, a, there was a proclamation that came from the, the government of San Francisco that they declared Rathiatra Day. And they said it was a festival of peace and they appreciated so much because everywhere else where there were demonstrations and protests, there were always so much violence. But Hare Krishna festivals are very peaceful and happy affairs. So this is Krishna consciousness. All right, are there, you know, I, we didn't ask every group. The other groups, would you, do you have some other points you would like to offer, which have, we haven't discussed? Anything? Hare Krishna Maharaji. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaji, one day I was, I just want to repeat what actually, one day I was listening to Gorang Prabhu lecture and he was speaking like that he was, he, he was on a visit to uh, jail uh, in the prison for preaching and uh, uh, so one of the prisoner was speaking sh uh, started speaking shastras giving the quotation of shastras then gorang prabhu was like astonished like in jail there is there are persons who are speaking shastras then uh, then then after the class when he approached him or he a, a prisoner approached him 
and uh, you know, he said he asked him that uh, you know uh, very well about shastras then how you are here in the prison then he said in the shastras it is written that um, uh, you you should not listen anything against your guru or vaishnava if you are listening then either you should kill that person or or you should leave that place so i killed that person and uh, that's why i went to the jail so it, here it is not uh, the literal meaning of killing demons so uh, uh, we should we can interpret it as uh, other devotees have said uh, in it may be killing of the miss uh, the wrong uh, misconceptions or the wrong ideas or the wrong uh, 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 thoughts in your mind the wrong deeds in your in your uh, character so uh, you can, you can we can interpret it in like that also. okay so, yes right, so. kill the demonic nature kill the demonic yeah. interpret the uh, demonic misunderstanding right okay Strange. thank you very much yeah we want to change the demon bring it back uh, krishna consciousness okay so we'll go ahead let me go back to the slides here um, a quote from prabhupad generally a vaishnava is non-violent just like arjuna in the beginning he was non-violent he said krishna what is the use of this fighting let them enjoy so by nature he was non-violent but he was induced by krishna to become violent your non-violence will not help you become violent you kill them i want <laughs> So, if Krishna wants, we shall be prepared to become violent. So those who are devotees of Krishna, they should be trained up both ways. They should be prepared. But generally, there is no question of becoming violent unnecessarily. Uh, one time there was a program in Amsterdam. It was in a park in Prabhupada's time, 1970s, they had a program in the park and there was a lot of, you know, Amsterdam, it's a very wild place, a lot of young people and a lot of intoxication and a lot of sinful life. And so there was some problem at one point and then one devotee had a big fight. One devotee actually jumped off the stage and started fighting, beating up this one man who had been giving some trouble. So Prabhupada was not pleased at all. Prabhupada said, this is very bad. He said, the problem is it can escalate, it can become a mass riot. You, you know, it becomes such a violent affair that everybody starts fighting. Luckily, it was just this one devotee with the other person who was fighting, but it could have become much worse. And so Prabhupada didn't like it at all. So it's not that Prabhupada is, was encouraging the use of violence. But here in the Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna, uh, well, Arjuna's situation is such that violence is necessary. They had tried to avoid the violence, but it wasn't possible. But generally, devotees, we prefer non-violence. If a devotee is attacked, then we should be willing to defend them and to go and help that devotee. If, if we see one devotee being attacked by other people, we should want to go and help him and be prepared to help and defend that devotee. If somebody attacks us, what should we do? <laughs> what do you think? Somebody attacks, you know, somebody attacks us, what are we going to do? Are we going to fight back? Not very good. 
and it's not really the devotee mood. Somebody attacks us. I remember one time, uh, one of our leading book distributors in Srila Prabhupada's time was a devotee called Pragosh, Prabhupada disciple, and uh, he was distributing books in, in the airport. You know, airports in USA are very passionate places, and not everybody likes devotees. So, Pragosh offered the book to someone and the man just punched him in the face. So what did Pragosh do? He said, thank you, Krishna. Now, Pragosh was a powerfully built man. He could have done something, he could have fought with the man, but he didn't do it. He tolerated it. And by tolerating, he was able to go on and distribute books. If he had become violent, that would have been the end of the book distribution. So you have to consider the situations very carefully. You don't want to be using violence where it can be avoided. You don't want to uh, make unnecessary troubles. And sometimes it's necessary to be tolerant. I was listening to Madhavananda Prabhu give a lecture just recently. They were broadcasting. He was, he was talking. He was giving a lecture about Gadara Pandit or Vakrishvara Pandit. You know, he's a scholarly devotee. So he was talking about how he used to distribute books in his, old, in his early days as a devotee. And he said a number of occasions people jumped on him and beat him and knocked him down. But he never fought back, and devotees tolerant. And that's expected of a devotee, that we, we tolerate, unless it's an extreme situation. Are there any questions? Okay, we'll go ahead. Vaishnava integrity. The exchange of spiritual happiness between Krishna and his devotee, in which Krishna is controlled by his devotee, is compared to an ocean of nectar into which the devotee and Krishna plunge. This is the verdict of learned scholars who appreciate Krishna's opulence. So, spiritual happiness. Devotees, we, we want to experience this. Actually, we, we often forget what is real happiness. We're thinking happiness is just satisfying our senses. But real happiness is spiritual. It's an experience of the soul. So described here, it's, there's an ocean of nectar. So Vaishnava integrity, one of the aims of our uh, Bhakti Shastri course, and the purpose of Vaishnava integrity is to ensure that students develop Vaishnava integrity in the interpretation, evaluation and application of Shastric knowledge. It's not just only memorization, it's not enough. We have to be able to interpret evaluate and then apply the knowledge of the scriptures. So this is the purpose of the Bhakti Shastri course. We hope that we will all gradually improve our evaluation and our application of this Shastric knowledge. All right, so here's Krishna on the battlefield with Arjuna and Krishna's uh, being directed by Arjuna, Arjuna speaking, text 21, 22, can someone, re oh, okay, here's the English, oh infallible one, please draw my chariot between the two, between the two armies, so that I may see those present here who desire to fight, and with whom I must contend in this great trial of arms. So we see Arjuna ordering Krishna, O oh, infallible one, O oh, Chuta, draw my chariot between the two armies. Right? Oh, so this objective is already, 
let's go back to that. So what's the point here? The point is that Lord Krishna is the supreme controller, but he's taking orders from his devotee. Is that appropriate? Is Arjuna, is he going out of line? Is it proper for Arjuna to be giving instructions to Krishna? Put my chariot between the two armies. I want to see who's here. Any problem with this? What, what is the point being made? What do we understand? This is, uh, this is what the loving, ex uh, loving exchange between uh, a devotee and the Lord. Yes, the loving exchange. Can you give more examples? Uh, maybe uh, Yashoda Damodar. Okay, yes. Any other example? Yashoda Damodar, oh, that's, that's the obvious one. Yes, how Krishna. Krishna, while having, a, you know, while playing with his sakas, he was carrying his sakas on his back and, you know, right, giving them a ride. Yes, right. Krishna was, he's sometimes defeated by the cowherd boys, right? Sometimes they take sides and sometimes Krishna will be defeated and he has to carry someone, someone on his back. Good, yeah. That's a nice example. And then, any other one? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Krishna was carrying uh, his father's slippers on his head. Oh, okay. Yes. Lord Krishna as a child would bring Nanda Maharaj's shoes, uh, slippers on his head. Very sweet child. How will you feel? Your... Krishna. Yes. Krishna and Sudama passed time. Although Krishna was in Dwarka, which was full of opulences, all the opulences. But you know, when Sudama arrived, and you know, with just a handful of rice, of rice. So Krishna was, uh, Krishna wanted to have that rice. Krishna was, uh, wanted to have that rice of Sudama. So that, I mean, although Krishna have all the opulences and everything, but still he wanted to have, uh, because he want, he always want to give pleasure to his devotee. So that's why. Okay, yes. Because Sudama was offering with great love. He brought his offering with love. And Krishna accepts that love. Doesn't consider what's being offered. Oh. Maharaj Krishna eating the banana deal uh, offered by Vidurani. Can you, Krishna eating what? The banana peels offered by uh, Vidurani. Offered by Vidura. Vidurani, Vidura's wife. Oh, really? It was Vidurani who was offering the banana peels, is it? No. Oh. I'm hearing that for the first time. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it was usually the wife would offer, yeah. Usually we hear Vidura. You say Vidurani. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, Krishna is under the control of his devotees. That is the point, right? That Krishna is unconquerable, but he's conquered by the pure love of his devotee. So Krishna, have you studied Nectar of Devotion yet? Hare Krishna? Did you study? No, 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 no. Did you study anything yet? We studied nectar of instruction and upadesha. Oh, nectar of instruction. You studied. Did you study Ishopanishad yet? Yes, Maharaj. We did that. Ishopanishad and nectar of instruction. Both books. Okay. So you still have. Anyway, you saw. Uh, you know yourselves how Lord Krishna is unconquerable, but he is conquered by the pure love of his devotees. And Krishna becomes the servant, he becomes controlled by the pure love of his devotees. 
So we see here in the Bhagavad Gita when Arjuna is ordering Lord Krishna that it, because Krishna is under the control of his pure devotee. He's come as a servant. Although, he's, although Krishna is the supreme controller, he's under the instructions of Arjuna and he's taking the position of the servant of his devotee and bringing the chariot into the middle of the battlefield. So this is the loving reciprocation between the Lord and his devotee, Arjuna. All right, so let's look at some of the objectives. Identified examples of Duryodhana's diplomacy, right? So give me some examples. Who can remember? Let me hear some examples, Duryodhana's diplomacy. So he recited son of Drupada, uh, uh, that words. I'm sorry, not clear what you're saying. Please say it again. He, he recited that uh, the son of Drupada, uh, you. Who? What did he say? The son of Drupada, who was he talking to? Uh, to Drona. Why? That. Uh, because uh, he wa his son was on the other side. What's the significance? Uh, because uh, he was destined to kill Drona. Okay. And yet Drona ditched him. Yeah, so Duryodhan was reminding Drona that on the other side is your disciple. What's his name? Drishtadumna. Drishtadumna, right. And he's, he's born to kill you. You have to be careful. He's arranged the army. You're fighting. You trained him, you educated him. Now you have to fight him and he's there. He's supposed to kill you. So you have to be careful. So that was one point about Duryodhana's diplomacy. Another point? In verse number 11, Aparyaptam and Pariyaptam. Yes, explain. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Duryodhan was mentioning Aparyaptam because uh, for his army. I mean, he's using using this term Aparyaptam for his army because you know they have most. They were protected under the guidance of most experienced general Bhishma Dev. Uh, his strength is immeasurable, so that's what he's saying. And whereas the Pandavas were protected under the less experienced uh, Bhima Sen. Okay. So that's why he's using the term Pariyaptam. Very good. Which is limited. Yes. Nice. Yes, another example. Maharaj, he was saying about uh, that there are so many warriors in his army, Vikarna, Karna and everybody. But at the same time, he he, he also said uh, they should all carefully protect Bhishma. Uh, so he was uh, sort of playing diplomacy, wanting the support from Bhishma is at the same time encouraging the other warriors as well. Yes. And when he mentioned different names, who did he mention first? He was mentioning the names of the different great warriors on his side. Who did he mention first? Bhishmadev. Bhishmadev. Bhishmadev first. Why? Because he knew that, you know, Bhishmadev will give him full support. Well, what about Drona? Now Drona's position is greater than Bhishma. Bhishma is a Kshatriya. Drona is a Brahman. Now Bhishma may be older than Drona, but Drona is a Brahman. So actually before he mentioned even Bhishma, he mentions Drona. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my respectful obeisances. Maharaj, actually Duryodhana knows that uh, Vishnu Deva has special compassion towards Pandavas. So we just want to be confident uh, to keep Vishnu Deva in our sight, to mention his name prior to 
ત્રણ And then there was also, there was one of Duryodhana's brothers who was not a very great fighter, but Duryodhana mentioned his name just to encourage him, make him feel important. Okay, then the liberal nature of Brahmins with reference to Dronacharya. What was the liberal nature? What did Dronacharya do? Showing the liberal nature? One person. Yes, please speak. Maharaji Dronacharya uh, taught uh, lessons to both Kauravas and Pandavas, uh, respective of uh, and acting. So but, he was very liberal in giving teaching to everybody, even to Drishta uh, Yes, and even to the one who is born to kill him, he accepted him yes. as a student. Okay. And the relevance of Arjuna's flag with Hanuman, yeah, we spoke about that. Yes, what's the relevance? This was the another sign of victory for Arjuna. As uh, you know, Hanuman was present in the war between Lord Ram and Ravana. So he is still here. So that gave the another sign of victory. So how does Arjuna think of Hanuman? How does he think of Hanuman on the flag? How, how is he relating to Han Hanuman on his flag? As a previous Acharya. Uh, yes, right. Previous Acharya. Arjuna is praying to Hanuman. As you fought for Lord Ram, please bless me that I can fight to please Lord Krishna. And then the significance of Arjuna ordering Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, Sina Yoruba Yor Majje Ratam Staya Paya Me Chuta. Right? Arjuna, Krishna is controlled by the pure love of Arjuna. Although Krishna is the supreme controller, he takes control, he takes instruction from his devotee. Then in relation to Vaishnava integrity, the consequences of misapplication of Prabhupada's statement regarding Vaishnavas and violence. Consequences of misapplication. What were some of the consequences we, we had? Do you remember? It, it can be like discriminating near devotees or that are demons like and committing Vaishnava Aparad in that way. Uh -huh. It can become also, also a sense of yes, a what? sense of disharmony, disharmony among the, those who are devotees and non-devotees. Yes. And even worse. Become fanatic, Maharaj. Yes, become fanatic. And we may lose the whole mood about preaching that all oh, these people are demons, you know, we can't do anything with them and we just don't try to preach. We don't. But even the demons, you know, even people are demons, they like prasadam. Give them prasadam. You know? If they'll take it. So, you know, we definitely want to be very careful in discriminating against people. Mood and mission. Identified aspects of Prabhupada's mood and mission revealed in the preface and discussed the importance of these aspects for ISKCON. These aspects for ISKCON. If even one person becomes a pure devotee, that's very good for ISKCON. We need pure devotees to save the planet from going to hell. 
And so we need authorized editions of Bhagavad Gita as well. We need to let people know what is the real message of the Bhagavad Gita. We don't want people to be misguided in understanding the Bhagavad Gita. So it's very important that they should hear through the disciplic succession. And so ISKCON has an important role to play. That we show people how to apply the message of Bhagavad Gita. Other places they may read the Bhagavad Gita, they don't live it. ISKCON shows people how to actually apply the message of Bhagavad Gita. All right, so it's Prabhupada's Mudan mission. Final quote from, ba from Prabhupada's purport, chapter 16. If one understands Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita and becomes situated in Krishna consciousness, engaging himself in devotional service, he has reached the highest perfection of knowledge offered by the Vedic literature. If one adopts the principles enunciated in Bhagavad Gita, he can make his life perfect and make a permanent solution to all the problems of life. This is the sum and substance of the entire Bhagavad Gita. Okay? Reading assignment. Tomorrow we will continue with the first chapter. You can read also setting the scene and go from 24 to 40, 46 and we hope we can finish chapter 1 tomorrow. Any questions? Anyone? Any comments? Any questions? Anyone? Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, yes, sir. I thought I was thinking, you know, like during this class, um, you know, that usually it's our um, not nature, but we, we tend to control the material world to um, be the controller, be the enjoyer. And uh, we're trying hard every day to. And uh, I just like this thing, this idea about this. Uh, Actually, in some way, we're even able to control, but that's only out of love for Krishna. But we're trying so hard to on ourselves to control things and whatever, and that is just so miserable and not really working out. <laughs> just have this thought during this time. Thank you so much. Yeah, the more we surrender and become the servant, the more we'll be happy and enjoy. But when we try to be the controller, we will, we will feel so much difficulty, so many problems come. And so we have to learn to pr be properly situated, proper situation, be, to, be, to be the servant, right? There's more pleasure, more pleasure in being the servant than in being the master. And a lot of people I know who are managers, who are, who are big controllers, big, you know, maybe they're doing business or like, they will all agree, they all say, it's so true, it's so true. There's no enjoyment in being the master, being the, it's all suffering. Much better be a servant. So that's why Krishna came as servant, he came as Lord Chaitanya, just to be the servant and to show us how to be happy, chanting and dancing. Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Jai. Jai.